If you're interested in one-on-one -on -one help with anything CPAP, there's a link in the description. We're all trying to figure out why we're still tired, right? The AHI and even the RDI is below five, sometimes even below one. So why are you still tired and cognitively impaired during the day? This doesn't make any sense. Do you question if you even have sleep disorder breathing sometimes? What if we measured arousals? Would this explain our feelings of daytime fatigue? In this video, I want to carry our investigation to that level to ask what is beneath the AHI and the RDI. Because if the AHI and the RDI are not explaining to us our subjective daytime symptoms, then is there something that does? Or are we shit out of luck? So a lot of patients will have an arousal summary like this from their sleep study. And we know that respiratory effort related arousals are bad. But beyond that, most patients are a bit confused of how much importance they should assign to any of the alternative arousal types, especially these spontaneous arousals, which I get a lot of questions about. So the question is, are these bad or are they normal? So let's begin to understand this together. The first basic question is, are all arousals bad? Are any arousals normal? Well, the answer to that is actually yes. Even in sound, normal sleep, arousals actually seem to play an important physiological role. And so the presence of arousals, as measured on EEG, is not enough to illustrate that there is a problem with sleep because some number of arousals is considered normal. Well, what is that number? How many are normal? This is actually well established in the literature. There's a little bit of variation between studies, but they all kind of fall around similar numbers and they seem to go up as we age. Here's one such study, the arousal index according to total sleep time. This is in normal sleepers. For teenagers, it's about 13.8 spontaneous arousals per hour. Standard deviation can be seen in parentheses. For young adults, it's 14.7. Middle-aged, about 17.8. You can see it's gone up quite a little bit. And then for the elderly, it's about 27. Here's a second study. You can see the age groups up here, 18 to 20, 21 to 30, 31 to 40, and so on. And then after they adjust everything and they look at arousals just as spontaneous arousals, you can see we have 9.8 for the first group. 10.1, 16, 14.9, 16, 21 as we get a lot older, and so on. And here you can see the relationship of the spontaneous arousal index with age. You can see here's the arousal index on the y-axis and the age on the x-axis. So this line is just showing, these are all the dots. This is the trend line. And it's just showing the older we get, this whole graph, all it says, it just says the older we get, it's more likely that the arousal index or the number of arousals you have per hour will go up. That is the older we get, the arousal index goes up. Okay, so we know we have a some number of arousals that are considered normal per age group. So can't we just add arousals on top of those averages and then get an idea for how many arousals are abnormal that are on top of the normal spontaneous arousals? Well, unfortunately, it's not that simple. It's actually a little bit more complicated than that. Let's ask another simple question. We'll come back to that complexity. And that question is, well, what's the relationship between the number of arousals and sleepiness? So here are two little interesting graphs. On the left, we can see arousal index and AHI. And all this graph is saying is the higher the AHI, the, the higher the arousal index. That is, if we have a high AHI, it's reasonable to expect a high arousal index. It's not always the case, but the relationship is pretty strong. For example, this patient here has a very high AHI but actually has a very low arousal index. And this patient here has a very high arousal index, but a low AHI. This, this graph is actually a little bit more what we're after here. So this is measuring basically tiredness. That's what this ESS stands for, the Epworth Sleepiness Scale. It's a questionnaire that has been used for a long time in the sleep medicine space. And it basically just measures subjective feelings of tiredness. This is the basic questionnaire in case you're interested in tallying up your numbers, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. It just gives an idea, giving everyone the same questionnaire, how tired someone might be. There are many tests to measure people's 
tiredness, fatigue, and so on, objectively and subjectively. For example, there's the multiple sleep latency test, which basically measures how long it takes someone to fall asleep in a super boring position. And all of these tests, what's important to understand is all these tests have severe limitations. It's pretty good. Let's just put it there. Let's just say that. The TLDR is it's pretty good. So this graph is just asking, well, what's the relationship between the Epworth sleepiness scale and the arousal index. And you can see it's actually not that strong. Strong would be a higher slope like this, but this slope isn't as high. You can see it's uh, it's much lower. You can see the dots are kind of all over the place. They're not clustered around this line. There is a relationship, but it's not super reliable. And down here, you know, the author, the authors say this difference may be related to the limitations of the Epworth sleepiness scale, which is a fair statement. Okay, so that's not really what we were expecting, right? So the arousal index itself doesn't seem to be a super strong predictor of daytime sleepiness. So what may be contributing to that, let's say, less than robust relationship between arousals and sleepiness outside of the limitations of the Epworth sleepiness scale, which we've already mentioned, is the fact that it seems that there seems to be a mutual influence between physiologic and pathologic arousals. In other words, there's a lot of evidence that's suggesting that, for example, a respiratory effort related arousal could just take the place of a spontaneous arousal. And whether there are additional complications or not, it's kind of muddied because we're not counting an additional arousal. Does that make sense? For example, in sleep disorder breathing, a certain amount of respiratory induced arousals may simply replace spontaneous ones as expected from their natural distribution across the night. And to support that, for example, acoustic stimulation during sleep increases the amount of noise induced arousals and reduces the amount of spontaneous arousals. So the speculation here is that arousals due to disturbance may, in the process of that arousal, actually take care of some of the physiological process that may be taking place in the normal spontaneous arousals, and therefore the need for spontaneous arousals is reduced. So this is all just to say, though, that arousals aren't exactly the ideal ideal metric by which we can measure the sleepiness, excessive daytime sleepiness that we see in patients, because the relationship is pretty complicated. Now, again, it is important that we do acknowledge that more arousals is correlated with greater sleepiness. It's just a weaker correlation than I think most of us have in the back of our mind. See, one of the issues that we continuously run into in this field is having rigid and unscientific scoring rules for what's considered bad or countable and what's not. ARERA, just like an apnea, just like a hypopnea, has a set of criteria that have to be met and then we can count the event. And if some physiological process or amount of disordered breathing occurs that doesn't meet those criteria, well, then it's not counted at all. For example, a rear has to have a sequence of breaths lasting at least 10 seconds characterized by increased respiratory effort. So what if it's nine seconds? Okay, so we have an event where there's disordered breathing. It's eight seconds, heart rate spikes, negative pressure drops, pleth drops, autonomic activity detected, but it's a nothing burger according to the regulators, because it doesn't meet these arbitrary criteria. That would be in a spontaneous arousal. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me, but that's just the world, right? We have lots of things that don't make sense and we just continue to do them. And so we must learn to navigate the nonsensical world in which we find ourselves. And so now that I've laid down all this context, I hope the destination at which I'm trying to have us arrive is becoming clear. The question becomes, are these spontaneous arousals truly spontaneous, normal arousals? Or were they arousals that were much more of the nature of a respiratory effort related arousal, but got tallied as a spontaneous arousal because they did not meet the strict criteria that must be met in order to tally it as a respiratory effort related arousal? 
And the most reputable sleep physicians, they understand this, and they're going to attribute typically more importance to arousals, which maybe didn't quite meet those criteria, but do demonstrate a clear episode of disordered breathing and coinciding physiological response. Now, the important thing to always remember is to ask ourselves, in our current measurement, who are we forgetting? And although I did say yes, many arousals, and of course, it's, I'm not. this isn't just my opinion, it's what the literature shows, many arousals is bad, but it's not necessarily a super strong relationship. So what are we to make of people who have a low amount of arousals, but perhaps feel terrible and present with daytime symptoms? The, the purpose of this entire video was to lay the groundwork for the topic which I wish to cover in the next video, which goes past arousals, and which looks at the microstructure of sleep and micro arousals. If you guys wanna stick around for that, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you in the next video.